But Allison, you want to kick us off? I sure do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction. I, I have to echo the the um, the adoration of Nina. Let's <laughs> let's be clear. So I want to tell you a story about taxpayer rights. I want to tell you a story about the taxpayer's right to know what the law requires of her and to have the law administered fairly. This is a true story based on things happening right now. I'm telling you this story instead of going, uh, giving you a presentation on the law with a PowerPoint and statutes written out because sometimes the law is too complicated and technical. It's even too complicated and technical for us tax lawyers to understand. Uh, moreover, the law itself doesn't explain what isn't written on the books, which can sometimes matter more in terms of how things play out in practice. Um, as you'll hear, the implementation of a law gives rise to a taxpayer's rights issue, one that wouldn't be clear from just reading the law alone. The story I'm going to tell you is about a woman named Tina. She's Canadian. She's 62. Tina is nearing retirement age. She's been a cautious and diligent person all her life, carefully saving for her old age, following the textbook investment advice we all know so clearly that tells us to invest in low load pooled investment vehicles, mutual funds, and hang on to them for the long term. Tina isn't buying and selling her portfolio. She doesn't have time for that. She has two kids and a husband she lives in the family home she bought with him about 30 years ago. She's hanging in for slow and steady, reliable, low-risk growth, planning for retirement in Canada, our friendly neighbor to the north. As a younger person, Tina occasionally took trips down to the States. Visiting Florida in February, still a uh, primary strategy and very tempting prospect given the harshness of Canadian winters. But Tina has only dreamed of that kind of vacation. She's very careful with her money. She plans to live on her savings. She doesn't want to burden her children. One day, Tina finds a letter in her mailbox. It's from her neighborhood bank where she's been banking for 30 years. She has all of her checkings and savings account at this bank. I want to read the letter to you. Dear Tina, in accordance with US law, we have undertaken a review of our files and have discovered indicia that you were born in the United States. Accordingly, you must furnish us with the enclosed withholding certificate form W8BEN, signed under penalty of perjury in the, Uni in the United States, indicating that you are not a US person for US tax purposes. In addition, you must furnish us with a certified copy of your certificate of loss of nationality, your CLN. If you do not furnish us with these two items within 30 days, we must treat you as a US person and your accounts as reportable accounts for US tax purposes. If your accounts are reportable accounts, you must furnish us with a withholding certificate form W-9 indicating your status as a US person and you must provide us with your US social security number. Any failure to provide us with your US social security number when asked will result in a $100 fine. If you fail to comply with our documentation requests, we may be required to withhold tax for remittance to the IRS. Continued noncompliance will result in account closure, including cancellation of your mortgage. In accordance with US law, we will furnish the following information with respect to reportable accounts to the Canada Revenue Agency, which in turn will furnish this information to the US Internal Revenue Service. Your name, your address, your US Social Security number, your Canadian Social Insurance number, your account numbers, the name and information of any person sharing your accounts, the highest amount in your accounts any time during the year, and any gross amounts paid into your accounts during the year. Thank you for your attention to this matter, your bank. Tina reads this letter through a few times and tries to understand it. Withholding certificate, certificate of loss of nationality, US person, reportable account, Fine, account closure, mortgage cancellation. Yes, she says to herself, it's true. I happen to have been born in the United States, but it was while my Canadian parents were on exchange as students. I'm not really 
American. I don't have a social security number. I never voted for president. I don't have a passport. I've only ever been there on vacation. This can't be for me, right? If it had come as an email, Tina thought it might be a phishing attempt and she should forward it to someone. Concern, Tina calls her bank. Her bank's employees are all very nice in that friendly Canadian way. <laughs> Sorry, but the rule is if you're born in the US, you have to prove evidence to the contrary or we have to treat you as a US person. One clerk takes pity on Tina. Look, I know this is crazy and it's catching everyone by surprise. You're not alone in this, but you need to talk to somebody who knows something about US tax law. Maybe find a US accountant? Tina goes home and talks with her husband, a Canadian since birth. He doesn't think it sounds right. How can the US be after you? You're not really American. How can Canada give your information to the US? You're Canadian. After shaking his head a moment, he realizes, hey, those are my accounts too. I don't have anything to do with the US. Why do they get my information when that's no business, they have no business knowing it? Tina and her husband decide to ask around. Tina calls one of her kids who's just as clueless but promises to do a little digging. A trip down the Google rabbit hole? Quite alarming. The message boards and blogs are buzzing with horror stories about something called OVDP and compliance and CLNs and fines and penalties and interest and how the US is on a global hunt to find all of its hidden citizens using foreign accounts after Congress passed this law called FATCA. Fat cat? No, no, no. FATCA. A few years ago to crack down on tax evaders, but now ordinary people are getting hit with massive fines and losing access to their life savings. Tina and her family are scared. They know they're not tax evaders, but they don't know what to do. Tina doesn't know what to do about that W-8. She doesn't have a CLN or any idea how to get one. She and her husband don't even know where to start. Is Tina really a US person? Even though she never got a social security number, never applied for a passport, never earned income in the US, Never spent time in the US except as a tourist, as a kid? The blogs say she could be in big trouble. Tina decides she has to put her mind at ease by speaking to an accountant with US tax expertise. Surely they'll just clear this up. Tina learns from the accountant that unless she has renounced or relinquished her US citizenship, she's a US person and she needs to provide her bank the information it wants and they're gonna send her information to the IRS. But it's not just tax forms the IRS wants, they also want this report called an FBAR, a foreign bank account report. And there are multiple penalties associated with any failure to make any of the required filings. Tina doesn't think she's relinquished or renounced her citizenship, but she wonders if maybe she could do so now? <laughs> After all, she's not really American by any stretch of the imagination. The accountant says, unfortunately, you can't renounce until you go back five years and undertake compliance, uh, five years, and then you have to pay a fee. So no matter what, Tina, the Canadian, finds herself considered American. And she's gonna have to get compliant. She's one of many such accidental or incidental Americans, many of whom live in Canada. But it's of no matter how she acquired US person status, or had it foisted upon her. Only once she's compliant with US laws to which she never knew she was subject can her accountant help her renounce her status. But renouncement's not gonna come cheap. When Congress passed FATCA, it noticed more people renouncing their citizenship. And so in an effort to discourage this, 
they recently hiked the fee to $2,350 to be allowed to leave. Of course, this amount is on top of all the paperwork involved to leave, and a lot of paperwork can bring more tax to pay. Tina's overwhelmed. She says she'll cross that renunciation bridge when she comes to it, but in the meantime, she has to comply with the law to avoid anything terrible happening. The accountant reassures Tina there are a lot of people in her situation suddenly discovering they're American and have tax obligations in a country they don't call home. Unfortunately, finding out she has U.S. tax obligations is only the start of things for Tina. When she starts to discover all they entail, she's in for an absolute tailspin. Because Tina hasn't planned her life with U.S. law in mind. It turns out all those low load pooled investment vehicles, mutual funds, there's something called PFIX. The accountant explains that the rule for PFIX, passive foreign investment companies, was passed to stop rich Americans from holding their investment portfolios through companies in tax havens, thereby avoiding U.S. tax obligations. But PFIX rules don't distinguish between tax havens and places like Canada, which also taxes these kinds of investment vehicles. Since none of Tina's investment savings are in the United States, the accountant tells her that probably all of her mutual funds are going to fall under the rules for PFIX. The bad news is that the PFIX regime is designed to be so harsh that no one would ever own one. It's a deterrent. The only reason you would, the only way you would own one is if you were treating it as a partnership, making it mark to market on, it, on an annual basis. Since Tina didn't do that, she's going to be subject to this harsh tax treatment, which in effect means going back over the entire holding period of each mutual fund, calculating U.S. tax at the highest U.S. tax rate in effect in the year in question, and calculating an interest charge for the delayed payment of that tax for each year, and then compounding the interest forward to today. The account explains that this all but wipes out her return on the investment. That's what PFIX designed to do. He then explains that selling won't help, and in fact makes it worse, because the gain on the sale will also trigger Canadian tax, and this tax under the PFIX rules is not creditable against the US tax. In effect, she's looking at a combined tax rate on her retirement nest egg of a conservative 70%, with 100% not an unreasonable estimate, and possibly even eating into principle. And all of this is the case even though Tina would otherwise be in the lowest marginal tax bracket or not even make enough income to have to file taxes at all in the first place. The accountant notes as an aside that Tina's family home may also generate some tax liability in the future since in the US some gains from the principles, the sale of your principal home are taxable. That is too worrisome to think about so Tina puts that as thought aside for later. I think you could understand why Tina might be more than a little overwhelmed at this point in the story. And that's even before I tell you that the accountant is going to charge her fifteen dollars to $20,000 just to get her compliant. And that if she had known any of these issues in advance, she surely would have made some different choices over the years. One of those choices would have been to avoid certain kinds of pooled investment vehicles or at least undertake mark-to-market -market accounting to avoid the interest charges. Another would have been to put all of her assets in her non-U.S. spouse's name. That's right. Tina would have been advised to divest of all of her assets. This is real advice that real American women are getting from real accountants right now all over the world. I'm not really quite sure what policy goal that serves, but let's leave that alone for now. In any event, Tina did not know any of this, and no one told her anything until she found out from her bank teller, some blogs, and an accountant in Canada that she's now at risk of losing her retirement savings because of a country she stepped foot in only a handful of times. Tina doesn't know where to find information that she needs. And the stories about the IRS imposing monstrous penalties on others who went th through offshore voluntary disclosure are terrifying. I would venture to guess that no one in this room 
and no one watching this later thinks this is a good outcome from a policy perspective, even if all the rules that I've described were adopted for good reasons. All this brings me back to the subject of this conference, taxpayer rights. What is fair for a taxpayer to expect from a government that seeks to tax her? And what can and should tax administrators do to make things okay for the thousands upon thousands of TINAs that are living through some version of this scenario right now? First, regarding what a taxpayer has a right to expect from a government that seeks to tax her. I think a taxpayer has a right to learn that a government seeks to tax her from that government itself and not from a bank employee in another country with no US legal knowledge or exper expertise, and certainly not from blogs written by those who understandably feel hard done by by this situation, or possibly worse, those who stand to gain by charging for compliance, very expensive tax compliance. My idea is, if that kind of information flow is hard or impossible for a government to deliver to its own taxpayer population, then that government should not be imposing such an impossible situation on an individual to begin with. Related to that point, I think a taxpayer has a right to learn that her whole financial life is subject to harsh deterrence and penalties solely for the reason that it is not located in the United States even and especially when she is not located in the United States. I think she has the right to learn that not from blogs or word of mouth, but from the government that seeks to impose these rules on her. I think she's got a right to be informed about a life-destroying force like PFIC by the government that seeks to unleash that force upon her. And a right to avoid that punishment by making different choices. And if a government can't or won't bother to inform her or address the utter absurdity of stripping a person of their life savings as a consequence of inadequate form filing, I think she's got a reason to complain that this is a pretty fair, unfair administration of a very complex tax law, a law designed for millionaires with expensive tax accountants and not for Canadians carefully saving for their retirement and not hiding anything from anyone. In my remaining time, which I know is growing short, I want to quickly cover three things I believe Treasury and or State could do today to address the ongoing trauma, what Joe called catastrophic failure in the last panel that's being unleashed on US persons in, in Canada and elsewhere, all over the world, right now. The first has to do with the PFIC regime. The PFIC regime results in, at minimum, a clear instance of double taxation. And my idea is that it can and ought to be fixed right away. It could be fixed by a general agreement between US competent authority and the competent authority of its treaty partners. Obviously, that includes Canada, but many other countries as well. Article 20, uh, as an example, Article 24 and 26 of the Canadian U.S. Tax Treaty gives the competent authorities the ability to enter into agreements consulting together for the elimination of double taxation in cases not provided by for the convention. There are plenty of precedents for competent authority agreements. We do them all the time for transfer pricing. If we can do it for multinationals, can we not do it for individuals? The second has to do with uh, high tax countries. Canada is a high tax country and most non-resident US persons live in high tax countries. For these people, most US tax results from timing differences in which the tax actually belongs to the source country, which is to say the country where the US person actually lives. It is therefore safe to exempt most, if not all, local accounts and savings from reporting and tax consequences altogether. Enacted as a same country exception as I suggested four years ago, or again, make it treaty-based relief of double taxation if you're worried about abuse. But this does two things. It eliminates pointless administrative costs on both the IRS and the taxpayer. 
It encourages compliance with U.S. tax law more generally because compliance goes from virtually impossible and absolutely terrifying to basically manageable for everyone with virtually no change in revenue generation in the long run. The IRS can use the saved resources to focus on the targets FATCA was intended to focus on, namely people who are trying to hide money in offshore accounts, not retirees with their names and information clearly associated with lifelong savings accounts in high tax countries. Lastly, if none of the above are possible, Treasury and state have got to find a way to allow people like Tina to make a free exit from the United States. I think this is a drastic situation and a worst case scenario. And in my view, it would be best to be avoided because it's so unnecessary. I'd rather not see it. But to be clear, I'm not talking about exit taxes, taxes that apply mostly to very rich people. No, I'm talking about the whole cost of getting into the system in order to be allowed out, only to be socked in the gut with a $2,350 fee to be allowed to leave. I think the place to start is repealing that renunciation fee. I believe this fee violates another individual right, namely the right to change one's nationality, which is enshrined in US law. I expect litigation to, re, uh, to, renounce, uh, to restore that right will eventually wipe away the renunciation fee altogether. But in the meantime, it should at least be possible to remove it for the Tinas of the world. That fee was imposed administratively and it can be revised the same way. Relatedly, the hoops and hurdles for streamlined compliance and other administrative action can and should be tailored to accommodate cost and penalty free, but most importantly, do it yourself possible compliance and exit for people like Tina. If we don't cut out the compliance industry, I don't know if we're going to be able to see change. My story has gone on too long and I apologize to my panel, but I hope I have at least highlighted how in the United States the issue of taxpayer rights is a global issue. If we believe the words of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights have any meaning at all, then we must agree that the Latinas around the world have a right to expect the U.S. to do a little better by them. Tina's case is not one in a million. It's one of millions. Millions of individuals abroad adversely and unfairly affected by US tax law. We can do better. And the Taxpayer Bill of Rights says we must do better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Allison. Uh, Al Allison, wh wh what happened to Tina? Well, cut off the end because there's not enough time, but the end would have said there's no happy ending for Tina. There's no happy ending for Tina? There's she, no way out. She's not going to sneak across the border, is she, and become a, oh, never mind, that's a, that's a whole different story.